At the end of this video, you will have a perfect understanding of the structure that you will be following when it comes to encountering any kind of computer vision task. Now, I'm going to show you this by taking on the simplest Kaggle competition out there, the MNIST Digit Recognizer competition. And over here, we will follow this workflow. We'll be first showing you how to directly import data from Kaggle onto your code editor. In my case, it's going to be VS Code. And then for this project alone, the dataset directly comes in the format of CSV file where all of the pixel values are recorded along with their corresponding output labels. So we don't have to manually convert the images to NumPy arrays. It is already done for us. Just keep in mind that this is the thing that you will have to do generally. And since we already Already have it in the format of a CSV. I will just directly get to visualizing the data, just directly seeing how the images are and how the output labels have been assigned to it. And following that, I will be normalizing the data, just making it easier for us to train. After normalization is done, I will be building the model architecture directly. We will be using convolutional neural network. Again, if you don't know what that means, I will explain when we actually do the coding itself. And once we build the architecture, I will feed in the normalized data for the model to actually train. And I will be using this trained model to make predictions on the test set and convert that to CSV and give it as a submission. Now that you know all of those, let's just directly get into the competition page itself in Kaggle. All right, here I am in the competition page itself. I will leave a link to this in the description box below. And the overview says that we will have to basically build a model that predicts what digit is it given in the image and the image contains a handwritten digit itself. Now, when you get to the data column, you will see that there is a bunch of numbers. These are all the pixel values and there is 784 pixel values. Again, I will show you that when we visualize the data. Now, what I want you to do here is just scroll all the way down and then find this command over here, copy this. Now to import this entire data set directly onto our code editor let me just go to my code editor real quick now over here what i will do is first create a main.ipynb file this is going to be a jupyter notebook go ahead and open the terminal once you've made sure that you're on the right path just open command prompt inside of the terminal itself and then paste the command that you just copied and for this by the way you have to make sure that you have gaggle installed otherwise you just have to go ahead and type in pip install gaggle like that. When you do this, it's going to install Kaggle itself. For me, it says requirement already satisfied because I already have this installed. And once you've done that, you can just go ahead and directly paste the command that you just copied. Once you do this, this will download the entire data set in the format of a zip file onto the selected folder. Now, what I'm going to do here is actually import in a py file. All right, I have bought in here a .py file. It's a zip file extractor and what this does is it will extract the zip file onto the selected target location. And all you have to do is mention the zip file path. Where is it present? What you can do here is just copy this and then paste it and make sure to put double backslash. And then I also want you to mention the target path as well. This is where the extracted files will go. I'm just going to change this a little bit. All right. So now we've mentioned the target path and the initial source path as well. And then what this will do is first it will check if the mentioned path is already created or not. Otherwise it will create a folder and then it will use the zip file module from Python to extract the zip file, put it all onto the target path. And once that is done, it is going to print a message saying that all the files were extracted. You have to remember the extract all function. This will extract all to the specified path. All right. So now I'm just going to run this code. So now once that is done, it's going to give us a message saying all files extracted and you can also see that over here we get to train test and the sample submission.csv all right when you go to the train there is a bunch of things that you see here and what you have to do is first look at the first line this is the columns that we have and the first column is always going to be the label column that is the one that we're going to predict and the rest is going to be all pixel values all right so there's going to be from 0 to 783 so that is 784 pixels which in terms of dimensions would be 28 by 28 all right so i'm going to start off by importing a few things over here first i will We'll need TensorFlow as TF, and then I will also be importing NumPy, matplotlib, pandas as PD, like that. By the way, I just forgot to set up the kernel, and once that is done, now for now this should be enough because I'm just going to first visualize the data. All right, so once that the import is complete, I'm just going to directly import the path, which is going to be train.csv, and then I'll also be importing test. We can run this code cell. All right, our training data will be all of the other columns except the label column. This is the one that we're going to predict. So what I will do here is just type in train.drop, exactly the label column, and then set the axis as one. The, our Y train will be the label column itself. All right, so when you run this code cell, our training data along with the prediction label has been created as X train and Y train. Now I'm going to directly plot this. First, let's just create a fixed size, plt.fixed size. I'm just going to set this to be 10 by 10. And then let's just have say 25 images for i in range 25. So in order for us to plot 25 images, I'm just going to have this to be a five by five subplot. 
tensor matrix. And all of those will have the index of i plus one, which is from one to 25. And then we use the imshow function. This will be the function responsible for showing images. And then we will pass in the training data of each and every single row one by one. And then we will reshape that to 28 by 28. As I said earlier, the 784 pixels are of the dimension 28 by 28. So make sure to reshape this first. And then I'm also going to set the color map to gray. Actually, if we don't do this, I wanna show you what it does. So I'm just gonna clear this off. Our title is just going to be the label itself. I've set the axis off. So let's just turn this. Now this shows us the title itself. Again, it overlaps on top. So what I'm gonna do here is first give it a color map. Now what this color map does is, is I wanna convert this to a black and white format. The binary color map has just a gray scale that is from black to white. And when you run this, all right, now you get the images in the black and white fashion and then the labels itself will be on top of it. So this is the one that we're going to predict. And to do a little bit of pre-processing, that is, I just wanna normalize all of these values. It's gonna be in the range of zero to 255. That is if I divide each and every single pixel value by 255 we will get a value between zero and one, which is much more easier for our model to understand and make predictions. So what I'm gonna do here is update the train data set by dividing it with 255. And we can't do this directly because we will have to reshape the values to 28 by 28. So what I'm gonna do here is on top of this, I'm just gonna first reshape it. X train dot values dot reshape. Now I'm gonna reshape these to 28 by 28 into one. The one that represents the channel. And in this case, it's just a grayscale image. So we don't need RGB for this. And this minus one represents the number of rows that will be remaining after we have separated the dimensions. All right, so once we've done that, I'm just gonna also manipulate my white train by creating categories. Now, this function over here, tf.keras utils, to categorical. Actually, what this does here is convert each and every single class that we find over here to 10 classes. All right, so when you run this, actually to show you, this will be a format of a list and it finds out which class does the image belong to. So when you see the first image, it belongs to number one. So it goes on to the first index, that is this will be a zero index and this will be the first index and the first index will be marked as one. This is basically one hot encoding. And once you do this, what you could do is actually go ahead and create the model itself. The model architecture will be a convolutional neural network architecture. And there's a lot of terms that is involved, as I said earlier. So what I'm gonna first do is create a sequential model. Actually, what I'm gonna do here is rather than just typing this one by one, actually I'll cut this and go over here and then type in from TensorFlow, but Keras import layers and models. So we will need the models as well as the layers from the Keras library. And over here, we just come back and then create from model sequential. We're gonna import a sequential model. Input is going to be passed on in a sequential fashion. And the first layer that I'm gonna add will be a layers.convolutional2d that has got 32 filters and the, the filter size will be three by three. Again, this is considered a kernel and we will have 32 kernels. I'm gonna have the activation function as value and then the input shape will be 28 by 28 into one. This parameter, you'll just mention it at the start, the very first layer of your model architecture. And if you're not familiar with kernel and other such parameters as padding and striding, we have a complete video where it explains every single term when it comes to convolution neural network, which is a basic building block when it comes to computer vision. I recommend you check that out. All right, so once we do that, I'm gonna pass the output of the previous layer to a max polling layer. Again, this is another term that we explain in the explanation video of convolutional neural network. What this basically does is shrinks the dimension of the output of the previous layer. This helps us in maintaining the most important information. And from here, instead of having this to be 34 filters, let me just start from 64 filters and then gradually reduce it a factor of two. So model.add and then thank you copilot for the octa complete. I'm just gonna change this to 32. And then again, I will be using a max polling layer of size two by two. This again reduces the dimension. I will also be adding one other such layers. So I'm gonna just type in layers.con2d. And then this time it gives 32. I'm just gonna change this to 16. So I'm gonna just stick with this output in terms of convolution neural network and just gonna flatten an all of those output that we get. And we have a string of free values that is each and every single unit will have a specific value rather than having it in a 2D fashion. Once we have that, I'm just gonna convert that onto a dense layer. So model.add, dense layer. The reason why I have mentioned 10 here is because we have 10 classes that we have to predict. And based upon the maximum probability, we will find the exact label for a given picture. We use the activation function as softmax when we have to predict 10 different classes in terms of images. All right, so that will be my model architecture. You can just work and play around with this trying different architectures, maybe start from 128 and then come all the way up to 16 or stop at 32 or 
as the copilot recommended you can start from 32 and then increase it to 64 and you can also change the filter size try a different pouring layer as well for this this already worked for me so i'm just going to stick with this run this and then i will use the compile function model.compile and then first mention the optimizer which will be adam we'll have to have a categorical cross entropy loss function this again is used for multi-class classification problem and i will be having my metrics to monitor as accuracy i'm just going to run this code cell as well now for us to train the model that is to feed in the data itself you will use the model of fit function and instead of fit function you will pass in the x train y train and then the epoch i'm also going to have a validation split now this actually means that we're going to split the entire training data into 80 and 20 that it does automatically and then we want the model to predict 20 percent of the data which it hasn't seen before and then we will see how the accuracy works on that one as well and this will happen after each and every single epoch once we've done that I'm also going to mention batch size to be 128. That is going to make it much more efficient. You can also try out 64 as well. Now when you run this code cell, it's gonna start training. And as we see, it starts from 65% accuracy and the validation accuracy goes up to 95. And by the end of 10th epoch, you will get the final results of how the model is performing. All right, at the end of 10th epoch, our accuracy is 99% in terms of training data. And then in terms of testing data, it is 98.35 this is the validation accuracy that is the 20 percent of the data that i just mentioned all right so once we get that now we can use this model to predict the test data set now what i will do is create a x test variable and then store the test values onto it again i will reshape that into 28 by 28 and then we will have one channel the rest all will be the number of rows the number of images or whatever you want to call it and then again i will be pre-processing this one as well before we provide this to the model and then now our white bread will be that is the prediction that we make i'm just going to call this to be white bread We'll type in model.predict and then we'll pass in x test. So we pass the testing data and then make predictions out of it. And then our y pred will be np.argmax. The reason why I'm doing this is actually because let me just show you without doing that. So once the predictions is done, y pred, when you see this, it will give us a range of probability for each and every single index. As you see over here, the first image that it sees is I guess will be two because it gives it a very high probability that it's going to be two, whereas the zeroth index or the first index has a very small value. So when you update the y predictions that we made to np.argmax function, it will give us the highest value of the given 10 indices and that will be two so it will give us the index itself so when you run this this time and then see y pred the first value is going to be two right here and then to visualize the results to make sure that the model is working perfectly let me just go ahead and create another figure plt figure fixed size will be 10 by 10 and then over here let me just actually do another 25 images again it gives us the same code that we wrote above but this time we're using the testing data to see how the model is performing again i've used the color map to binary and then we have reshaped the values again we don't actually need to do this what we could actually do here is directly go ahead and pass in x test of i and then when you run this code cell now it gives us the predictions itself as we see over here first one is going to be two and that's what it said and the rest all seems fine to me. Of course, there is a bit of confusion when it comes to predicting 9 and 0. And that is where the accuracy goes up a little bit. The 2% that we saw on the validation accuracy goes off here and there. Once we have made the predictions, I'm just going to convert this onto a CSV file and then provide that as a submission. All right, so I'm going to create a submission variable and then create a data frame where the image ID is going to be range of 1 to 28,000. And the reason why it's 28,000 is, let me actually just type in X test of shape. And it says that we have 28,000 images of 2828. Our range is going to be from one to 28,000. And then the corresponding label in terms of dictionary will be the predicted value. That is this. That creates a sample data frame. Let me just run that and then show you actually how it works. Submission.head. So it gives us the image ID and then the predicted label itself. So what I'm going to do here is just convert this to a CSV file and then I'm going to name it submission.csv and then I'm also going to set the index as false. So this column is the index and we don't need this column because we have image ID already. So I'm just going to set index to false and then we will get a submission.csv file. As we see over here, we get an image ID and label and then we also get the corresponding values. So this is going to be the file that I will be submitting. So let's just get to our Kaggle competition page over here. Just click on submit predictions and then just drag and drop submission CSV file that we just mentioned. So once we get that, click on submit and then that gives us an accuracy of 98.103. If we go to the leaderboard and then jump to our position, that puts us at 788. Again, you can also try out working with different architectures in the model or try to pre-process the data a little bit more. Or actually what I recommend is 
just playing with the model architecture to get much more higher accuracy. But what I feel here is the optimum accuracy that you would get when you train a model that has to predict handed in digits, that is the MNISD standard project. And in the next video of our computer vision series, we will be exploring the plant seedlings classification. And over here, we will have to look at the image and basically predict the seedling class that it belongs to. And this is a much bigger data set model and it's much harder to do so. We will be using a pre-trained model. When that video is released, we will be linking it right on your screen. You can click and watch that next.